I want to welcome everyone to this uh, marvelous evening. We just came from a dinner honoring uh, Ambassador Levy's service to the State of Israel. Um, he put 37 years in as a diplomat for the State of Israel, and he is now in delicious retirement, um, and we are the beneficiaries of that, so we're very happy to welcome you here. We will have a more formal welcome in a moment. Um, as a rabbi, I look forward, as a Jew, I look forward to the opportunity to do a mitzvah, to perform the commandments, and my rabbinic predecessor said that one of the great commandments in the Torah is returning lost objects. Someone at table six at the dinner left a pair of glasses behind, and you'll be sorry if you don't have them. Bjork, okay, I will bring them back, um, and, and I thank you. I just want to explain how the evening works. I hope I get this right. Um, standing over at the door, um, Miriam and Judy. Uh, Judy Greenberg is the uh, program what do, you, what do we call you? The program coordinator for the Milstein Center for Interreligious Dialogue, and I, I publicly want to acknowledge her, thank her for all the work she has done for this evening to make it happen. Um, so I'm going to read the line she requires me to read. Um, when Ambassador Levy has been introduced and has spoken, you should all by now have received an uh, index card and a golf pencil. The golf pencil is not there for you to record your score. Um, rather, it gives you the opportunity as you listen to the ambassador to jot down any questions you may have. Immediately following his talk, uh, Rabbi Jack Bemperad will engage him for a few moments, and in those few moments, I will remind you, we will collect your cards, I will sort through your questions, so that we can do a civilized Q&A with the ambassador afterwards. To begin the evening's uh, programs, I, I, I first want to call your attention, um, while I have a captive audience, to two upcoming programs that JTS is going to be doing in the, in the near, in near distant future. Um, you all, or most of you, have a two-sided page, so the first thing you learn is we're green. Um, the second thing is on uh, Thursday, October the 25th, one week from tonight, we are doing a program, Is There a War on Women's Health and What Does Judaism Have to Say About It? The Louis Finkelstein Institute for Religious and Social Studies has a program in bioethics, and that should be a fascinating and timely conversation. On the opposite side of the page, um, on December the 13th, which is Hanukkah, we will be celebrating one of our own Maccabees, the immediate past chief of staff, of the United States Air Force, a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Norton Schwartz, will be speaking on the topic, Shalom, Shalom, Yet There Is No Peace, Waging Peace and Making War. And that is uh, Thursday, December 13th, again here at the Jewish Theological Seminary. To kick off this evening, it gives me great pleasure to uh, call up the Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, Professor Arnold Eisen. Thanks, Bert. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening, commemorating the beginning of a historic process in the history of religious relationships. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. First, I want to thank our co-sponsors, the Milstein Center for Interreligious Dialogue at the Jewish Theological Seminary and the John Paul II Center for Interreligious Dialogue at the Angelicum in Rome. You know, Bert mentioned Hanukkah, and it occurred to me, we have a saying at Hanukkah, Nes Gadol Hayasham, it was a great miracle that happened there. And in Israel, they have, they have changed the wording a little bit to say Nes Gadol Hayapo, a great miracle happened here. We're about to hear from former ambassador to the Vatican, Mordechai Levi, ambassador of the state of Israel to the Holy See. Nes gadol hayapo. Maybe a double nes or a triple nes. We're talking about a reborn state of Israel after 2,000 years. And we're talking about peaceful relationships 
between that state of Israel, known colloquially to many as the Jewish state, and the Holy See in Rome, where Jews were often welcomed for disputations and all sorts of other unpleasant events, but not for the kind of peaceful, harmonious, respectful relationships that we have in our day. And as I said at dinner, you know, when you're a scholar of religious studies, one of the things that perplexes you and troubles you, I've been a scholar of religious studies my entire adult life, is how badly religions have treated one another and how often they've used the name of God to persecute and oppress and hate other creatures of God, whom they all acknowledge as the creator of these fellow creatures. And you know that something happened momentously to the history of the Catholic Church in the 20th century? Something momentous happened to the history of religion in the world in the 20th century? And something happened to the history of religious relations with the Catholic, Jewish relations with the Catholic Church? We, hold this, we call this a momentous event, Vatican II. And now we're marking its 50th anniversary. And for those of us who had the good fortune to be alive 50 years ago and are still alive this day, we can, we're here to thank God for the event that happened in our lifetime that really changed what it is to be a Jew, what it is to be a Christian, what it is to be a person of faith because of... Um, these things that happened in our time, and we're here to mark them and think about them together this evening with Rabbi, sorry, that's a slip, Ambassador Levy. We gave you another, at JTS we ordained rabbis. So I just, you've just gotten the title, but Ambassador Levy. I, I do want to introduce the man who's going to introduce, introduce Ambassador Levy, Rabbi Jack Pem, Bemporad in a moment. Rabbi Jack has a distinguished career in the history of interfaith relationships and bringing people together, not only at his Center for Interreligious Understanding at the Angelicum in Rome, but Jack Bemparad lives and breathes interreligious dialogue and mutual respect. He is a Holocaust refugee from Italy. He came to the United States at a certain point and was ordained by Hebrew Union College. He has engaged in probably thousands of religious interreligious dialogues beyond number. I think it's a great privilege to engage in one or 10 or 15. I think we can count thousands that advanced or took place because of your efforts. There's just one or two little pieces in his bio that I wanted to share with you because when I read the bio, these jumped out at me. In February 1990, Rabbi Jack Bemparad was sent to Rome to help negotiate the relocation of the Carmelite convent in Auschwitz, Poland. And in September 1990, he was the primary writer of the Prague Accord, which was the first time in history that the Vatican asked forgiveness of the Jewish people for past acts of anti-Semitism. We live in a time of uh, miracles. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Rabbi Jack Pemperod, who will introduce Ambassador Levy to help us mark one of those miracles. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chancellor Eisen. I'm, I'm very privileged and honored to be here, especially at, in this, in this uh, Jewish Theological Seminary, which really for many, many years has had uh, professors and teachers that have done so much uh, for interreligious work. I'm reminded of someone who I knew personally and have great respect for is uh, Rabbi Heschel, who as many of you know, had tremendous uh, interest and influence in, in these areas. But also, I have to say also, Mordecai Kaplan, who his whole attitude really was that we have to work together interreligiously in a, in a unique way. And so being here in many ways is almost being at the place where the faculty has acted so uh, effectively and consistently, and I think in a, a remarkable way, to further the very things that we're celebrating today. I do think that uh, the whole uh, Nostra Tate and Jewish-Christian dialogue is really the success story of the 20th century. When you really get right down to it, there are many, many things that have happened which are horrible. We all know we don't have to mention them. But that out of the ashes of the Shoah and out of the great terrible tragedy, and there are some here who have experienced it personally, uh, should emerge 
a chastened Catholic Church, which felt it had an obligation to do something about it. Not only John the 23rd, I had the great privilege of having an audience with him in 1960, and at that time he mentioned clearly that he wanted to do something about our past history, about what Jules Isaac told him was the teaching of contempt. And uh, John Paul II, and of course Benedict XVI has followed in that direction. One of the things that I think you should all be aware of is that the Berry Foundation is really at the forefront of trying to activate, help, and really implement this particular dialogue and this particular work. Um, I am privileged to teach at the Angelicum. I've been teaching there now for 17 years. That's a long time to teach in Rome. And we have a, prog a program of fellows where the Berry Foundation gives money for fellows to come from all over the world. We pick the very, very best students that we can from all over the world to train them and help them understand that interreligious dialogue and interreligious understanding is so essential. And I can say that I am very, very pleased and honored to see that practically all of them, if not most, are in very vital, uh, very vital positions in, ac in academia, in uh, being interreligious uh, priests, involving in dialogue and representing what they learned about Judaism and what they learned about these interreligious aspects to the world. We have as part of that, since uh, Professor Eisen mentioned Israel, and uh, Mordecai Lewy is of course the ambassador to, was to the Vatican from Israel, we have an Israel trip. And one of the things that's so amazing is you have these students who come from the third world where they've heard so many negative things about Israel. And in fact, they've been brought up, many of them, on the protocols of the elders of Zion. They think that's a scientific study. And then when they go to Israel, they say, we can't believe it. This is something that just is totally different. And they go back to their countries. And when anyone defames Israel, they stand up and say, I'm sorry, that's not our experience. That's no way. And Israel, by the way, we did not show them the best. We showed them what it was, its variety, its diversity. And so they have really been instrumental in bringing to their constituency and becoming the leaders in the Catholic world. And it's a, it's a great credit to the Berry Foundation that they have actually done that. Now, uh, let me say one or two words by way of introducing uh, Ambassador Levy. First of all, I think one has to keep this in mind. I have for years said that there, one of the fundamental questions that we have to ask and answer is, how can I be true to my faith without being false to yours? That is, how can I represent you in a way that you will recognize yourself as being properly presented. Now, when it comes to Jews and Judaism, one of the very basic problems that Christians have is in trying to somehow bridge this idea of Judaism as a religion and Israel as a state and as a Jewish state. How do you do that? Now, it's easy for us to say that we have to represent the other in a way that that person would be willing to say, yes, this is a proper recognition. But how do we help the other understand it? That's the question. It's easy for us to say, you have, uh, it's incumbent upon you to understand me the way I understand myself. But what can I do and what should I do so that they will be able to see me in the way that I see myself? And this is a very interesting question because, as Ambassador Levy will tell you, part of his job is, essentially, to represent the state of Israel. But on the other hand, he has to also represent the Jews. He has to somehow represent the Jewish people, not officially, but unofficially. And as he will say to you, on many occasions, he has been called upon to intercede in areas that are not state areas. It's not a question of the state of Israel. It's a question of misunderstandings between Jews and Christians. And here, I can only say this. I've known all of the uh, ambassadors from Israel to the Vatican. He is a really seasoned diplomat. He's very modest. He works behind the scenes. He's not interested in getting into the press. He's very interested in achieving the results of better and proper understanding. And he has an enormous preparation for this 
First of all, he served as Consul General in Berlin following the unification of East and West Germany. He also um, served as the minister at the newly established Israeli Embassy in Berlin, initially as charge of the affairs and later as deputy chief of mission. He also served as first secretary and later counselor at the Israeli embassy in Stockholm. He rose to the post of ambassador, heading the Israeli embassies in Thailand and Cambodia. And from 1997 and until his accreditation as ambassador to the Holy See, he held various posts for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And this is very interesting. Among them, members of the Israeli delegation to the UN. So he's had a lot of experience dealing with the UN in New York, as well as the advisor for religious communities, Christian and Muslim, for the mayor of Jerusalem. And if anyone wants to know what is a really difficult diplomatic task, is to be the religious advisors of the communities of Christians and Muslims in the Holy Land. I consider him a great friend, a great source of help. Whenever I had any difficulty in terms of getting anything accomplished in the work that I was doing, I knew that I could find an authentic, knowledgeable, dedicated source who wanted to really bring about proper relationships between Christians and Jews. Ambassador Lev. Well, <clears throat> after, after such uh, compliments, uh, I have to uh, prove that I deserve them. Uh, but uh, I will uh, begin not with the topic itself, but only I will try to find the new definitions of myself. Uh, by the way, I'm now retired. You should know that uh, uh, I cannot be now uh, be uh, taken in responsibility of expressing official views. Although I have to tell you that when I was a junior diplomat, my training in uh, the academy, our ac diplomatic academy, told me, you know what? Express always the official um, opinion and say that it is a private opinion. But I'm retired, so I, in that sense, I don't feel obliged. But I, to my uh, justification, I have to tell you that uh, many op of my opinions which you hear today, I have expressed uh, during my term in the Vatican, and I was not shy about it. Um, I was, um, my, my trade is actually to be a historian. Uh, and I joined the diplomatic service, and I tried to be uh, the best uh, historian among diplomats and uh, among historians uh, uh, and among the diplomats to be their best historians. I don't know uh, if this, this could have helped me in Vatican because I found out that I have to be there a rabbinic or a theologian diplomat. And uh, in order to un you to understand what it means is that 15 years ago, when the relationships were established, uh, the Vatican refused to accept a candidate which was a rabbi. Um, the reason for that are quite clear, because the Vatican is has two legs or two levels, if you like the spiritual one, the theological religious entity, and the other one is a political diplomatic entity. The relationship with the State of Israel are of the second kind, of the political diplomatic ones. And they don't want to dilute the two levels because then they are losing an advantage. The advantage they have is being a double entity, if you like, Whenever they would like to dance on the parquet of religious theological parquet, they do it. And whenever they uh, think it deems necessary and fits their interests, they will do it politically. Now, uh, the nuncius is not only a diplomat, but also an archbishop. He has spiritual duties in the place where he is performing. And what shall I... Shall, uh, Israeli ambassador do 
who has never, who has no smicha in Rabbanut, has no, uh, uh, certainly is not so consecrated. Uh, he's only a diplomat and can, is, has, has an entrée for the diplomatic parquet only. I wanted, and this is really, I think, my contribution in the, how to perform there, uh, how to perform in both levels. By the way, I can tell you, frankly, that it is a very difficult place to serve in terms of shaping bilateral relations in the, in the political sense with a country which you don't have a balance sheet of trade with them, you don't have security relations with them, you almost don't have cultural relations with them. And I can tell you that usually when the political relations uh, are full of this political disagreements, you have usually an outlet dip diplomatically to do it in non-political issues, such as culture, academic uh, relations, and so on. But the Vatican doesn't have either cultural relations. The minister of culture, so to speak, is mainly occupied with new evangelization. So this is not my cup of tea uh, of cultural ties, so I shun away, even if I was invited to certain events, but it was, uh, I, sh I, showed, I showed disinterest in that kind of um, activities. The last, in order not only to, to, to give you a taste, what, what does it mean? There is in the Vatican a notion of, um, initiative, which is called the um, Court of Gentiles, Chatzar Haminim. This means, this is a forum which is going from place to place. It is uh, in Madrid, it was in uh, Stockholm, it was in other places, where actually the Catholic theologians do meet atheists. It's a, it's a bold effort to go back and to bring them back to, at least to a dialogue. Maybe they will be convinced later, but there's no, they're not on speaking terms even. And one of the ideas was to make such an event, I call it a wandering circus, in Jerusalem. So I had to explain, and I have to tell you, not directly, but indirectly, that the Minim are the Christians, not the Jews. Um, I, I'm, I'm telling you that in order to, uh, to you to have a insight in the in the intricacies uh, uh, which uh, we have uh, to uh, take into account. Another thing was when I was. I will not only speak about Israel, by the way. I will also speak about Jewish <laughs> Jewish Christian relations. Uh, one thing which struck me. I drafted a speech to submit it uh, on my ceremony of accreditation. Now, I got an advice from the Vatican, from the protocol chief. Please, I would ask you very much to delete the sentence where you, it can be understood that you are talking on behalf of the Jewish people. Since you are not accredited, you don't bring a letter uh, uh, of accreditation where the Jewish, any kind of Jewish body, which doesn't exist, by the way, uh, um, uh, asking you to represent him on behalf of the Vatican on the diplomatic level, stick to the formal uh, letter, which is signed by the uh, President of Israel uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, I, of course, this was actually the first encounter for me with what kind of problems I may face. And therefore I decided to play it, not as they would like, but to play it a little bit different. And to use my knowledge and experience in church politics, and in Jerusalem you can really get such an experience, and also probably from my academic uh, studies, to engage them in religious uh, issues and not in political issues, because if I would have been restricted only to the political 
parquet with the Vatican, it would have been a poor show. Why? Because on basic issues, we don't agree. You don't know it, maybe, because the Vatican, to his uh, merit, is not outspoken about it. It is never calling names. It is speaking in generic terms. If it has an opinion, it will not express it publicly. And if it will express it publicly, it will be when it is sure there exi uh, that an international consensus exists about it. And you could see it in many cases, uh, just in the turmoil in the Arab world recently, in the last two years, uh, there will never be for any kind of uh, violent actions. They simply would deny it, and this is, and they are very consequent on it. On the other side, uh, they will always call both sides to do this on that, and this is also what they did when we had the operation uh, sealed lead, Oferet Yetzuka. Everyone in the world was criticizing Israel. The Vatican was not criticizing Israel, but it was calling both sides to talk and to start uh, uh, to negotiate and whatever. So I would say that we were taking advantage in this case of um, the generic approach uh, on, about the, on the neutrality, uh, pro, neutral approach of the Vatican uh, because it was a rare com commodity on, in the international community. Um, I would say that, uh, by and large, we were well served um, in the years which I was uh, their uh, ambassador. And I think there is an overall trend politically um, from a more expressed uh, pro-Arab to a more balanced uh, attitude. This doesn't mean that they accept uh, 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 many things uh, which uh, Israel do or not doing, but it is clear that the four years were imprinted by uh, serious negotiations on the fiscal uh, uh, fiscal uh, agreement, which uh, made a lot of progress. It is not yet signed, but it is quite uh, near uh, for to conclusion. And there was a very interesting dynamics, which proves to be uh, very helpful that even in things which were regarded as insurmountable uh, difficulties uh, could be solved. And there are only small things uh, which uh, remained until uh, this agreement can be presented uh, to the uh, cabinet. It is, of course, very typical that from the Vatican side, they don't have that kind of machinery there. The delegation can present it directly uh, to the Pope, and no, no one can prevent him from um, endorsing it. Uh, the difficulties in the negotiations are the um, composition of the delegation themselves. In our case, it is four or five ministries, because it's this touching mainly dom domestic issues in Israel. And this is, by the way, one of the characteristics of the relations. Uh, the domestics in Israel are of essential importance for the Catholic Church because their interests are of fiscal nature, of legal nature, and which are, in both cases, touching uh, the Israeli legislation. Uh, whereas we don't have any property claims in uh, the Vatican, we don't have citizens uh, in the Vatican. The only citizen, Israeli citizen in the Vatican is a converted Jew, uh, which uh, getting a high post in the rota, in the jur juridical system there, and he is not denying uh, his Israel ship, so to speak. Uh, but it's only one. I saw ambassadors who are making receptions for their 
Landsmannschaften for their, uh, and it is very interesting and very important, this kind of network in, in, in the Vatican. So when the Polish ambassador is inviting, uh, 60, 80 uh, clergymen, dignitaries are coming, some of them cardinals. The same is with the German ambassador or the American ambassador. And I don't have anyone. <laughs> uh, not only that, Usually the big embassies, or those who really knows how to work in the Vatican, have their ecclesiastical uh, advisors. I would say, when the time will come that we will be able to nominate a clergyman from Israel to be our ecclesiastical advisor, I would call we reached a normalcy among the two religions. Even if it is, an, is a political act, a political or almost an administrative measure to nominate an, a, a clergyman, but this nomination would mean that he would be on special contract to the Israeli government, in this case the foreign ministry, and he will advise faithfully not to the Vatican, but to the embassy. This is the case in all other, with all the other a concert. I, at least, made myself friend, friendly with all those ecclesiastical advisors because I knew that they are, so to speak, in the respective embassies. Because it's always, and this is a lesson to learn, no matter which religion you have, but there is a kind of a osmosis of empathy between religious people. So they are taken uh, completely different, especially if uh, compared with a secular man, a layman, and I'm a non-observant Jew, um, in addition to that, uh, and I cannot speak on the same term. I tried my best in spite of all that. Now, I think it's time to come to the subject itself uh, I hope it will be interesting enough uh, for you uh, to follow. There is in the Vatican an ongoing debate. Ah, first of all, sorry. The first block of my uh, deliberations are dedicated to the question, why is the debate whether the Second Vatican Council is representing change or continuity in the Church re relevant to Jewish concerns? There is in the Vatican an ongoing debate about the direction the Church should go after the Second Vatican Council. Should one adapt to modernity and plead for change, or how it can be done without sacrificing the essential teaching of the Church and stay in continuity? This is a debate about the correct way to interpret the documents of the Second Vatican Council. In theory, this internal debate should not be of Jewish concern at all, let alone tell, taking side in the dispute. Nevertheless, Jews who are involved in Jewish-Catholic relations faced a real problem. How can they remain indifferent in the wake of an internal Catholic debate where the most important result of Jews might be sidelined or negated by those who are pleading for continuity in the Church. We speak, of course, of the declaration, Our Age, Nostra Aetate. For the sake of clarity, let me summarize its essentials. It's a catchword. You talk a lot about the term, but has rarely you know what is really written inside. First, it's a, a, a summary of essentials. It is connected Christianity to its roots, Abraham's talk. It says that Jews, it's a Jesus as well as Mary and the early apostles were all Jews. Third, the Jewish covenant with God is irrevocable since he does not repent of the gifts he makes nor of the call he issues. Fourth, rejection of collective Jewish responsibilities for the crucifixion. Fifth, rejection of any representation of the Jews as repudiated or cursed by God, as if such views follow from scriptures. Sixth, 
The church repudiates all persecution against anyone. This is a generic uh, formulation, and I think they were right because it can happen also to others. Seventh, the church deplores the hatred and persecutions directed against the Jews at any time and from any source. This is, so to speak, the candy, a specific mentioning of the Jewish case. And eighth, because all of the above, the spiritual patrimony common to Christians and Jews is thus so great that mutual understanding and respect, which is the fruit above all the biblical and theological studies and of brotherly dialogues, must replace any prior types of relationship. This declaration ignited the process of a historical rapprochement, which amounts to a revolution in Catholic approach towards Jews. This opening might bring to an end a 2,000 years old competition around the question who is more worthy to merit the benevolence of God and who is the ultimate chosen people. They were causing, those two, they were causing endless cycles of polemics and human tragedies. Nostra Aetate became a sine qua non for continuing the rapprochement between Catholics and Jews. This declaration has no doctrinal status for Catholic believers, however. Its essentials, nevertheless, have been repeatedly affirmed by several popes since 65. I should mention here Benedict, Pope Benedict, appreciation of the new elements introduced in the Vatican Council, obviously embracing Nostra Aetate within its own church teaching, the Magisterium. During his visit to the Grand Synagogue in Rome in January 2010, Pope Benedict said, the teaching of the Second, in a quote, the teaching of the Second Vatican Council has represented for Catholics a clear landmark to which constant reference is made in our attitude and our relations with the Jews, uh, with the Jewish people, marking a new and significant stage. The Council gave a strong impetus to our irrevocable commitment to pursue the path of dialogue, fraternity, and friendship, a journey which has been deepened and developed in the last 40 years through important steps and significant gestures. By the way, the consequence of this opening of the diplomatic relations has been established in, 1990, in, in 1993. Um, <clears throat> the rapprochement with the Jews was promoted with a special intensity in the Catholic Jewish dialogue in the United States. It is there where, or it is here, where the process of rapprochement is the most promising until now. We are aware of these special relations on local and regional basis within the context of communal services. It was forged in the 60s as an alliance between Catholic and Jewish communities, especially where both in America existed as minorities. <clears throat> Alleviating the Jews from guilt in crucifying, as Ratzinger did in his recent biography on Jesus, his constant repetition of the status of Nostra Aetate as church teaching, and his commitment, by the way, as, as a lack of doctrinal enforcement, because it is not uh, a doctrine, um, anti-Semitism and, the, uh, and, um, the, and, the Jewish, and his commitment for Jewish concern to combat anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism, which is, by the way, the paragraph, uh, the second paragraph in the basic uh, fundamental agreement, which allowed us to resume or to establish relations. So this, there is a Vatican commitment to combat, which we did not follow and... Uh, mm, discussed very deeply going because we were too much engaged with the fiscal negotiation and I would advise uh, anyone uh, after resuming the negotiations, uh, uh, the fiscal negotiations, to open up this paragraph and to see it as a basis of the next round of, of bilateral negotiation because there is a need 
uh, to engage the church more and not on the level of uh, uh, papal exhortations or uh, homilies, but also on the uh, diplomatic level, because this is very much lacking uh, up till now in the Vatican's activities. Um, <clears throat> what I would say that um, we cannot complain about the Pope himself as uh, favoring uh, the process of uh, rapprochement. He is very much for it. Of course, the Williamson affair was regarded as a setback which was celebrated, quote unquote, with an undertone of uh, schadenfreude and mischievousness by the media and the liberal circles. In January 2009, to recall, Bishop Williamson, together with three other bishops who belonged to a dissident sect, the so-called Lefebvreans, were absolved from a church ban, the excommunication. The internal disciplinary measure should not have concerned us so much as Jews. The problem was that this same Williamson was known as a Shoah denier, and therefore an internal measure was exposed all of a sudden as a major statement favoring a Holocaust denier at most, or at least neglecting Jewish sensibility. As an Israeli ambassador, I saw a thunderstorm, thunderstorm approaching, which might, might have cast such a shadow on our relations, and that the planned papal visit in May 2009 would have to be canceled. We had the diplomatic advantage that the planning phase was so discreet that only few officials knew of it on both sides. So the press was neutralized and it remained like that. I saw the Israeli interest in keeping the papal visit on the agenda at any costs. We should not forget that at the same time Operation Shield Lead took place in Gaza and critical minds in the Curia and among Catholics in the Middle East did not think that the timing for the visit would be appropriate. I responded to the public demand of angry Israelis why Benedict is not firing Bishop Williamson, that once consecrated as a bishop, he will remain always a bishop. This is difficult to understand for someone who doesn't know the procedures of uh, the church. <clears throat> My line of defending the visit was that the Williamson affair is a working accident, much regretted by the Pope and certainly not inspired by him. The circular note of the Pope published in 12th of March 2009 to all bishops stated his displeasure of how the case was handled in the Curia, and expressed also his thanks to Jewish friends of showing understanding in time of public distress. I for myself know that the Israeli government was convinced of the good intentions of Pope Benedict, and maybe I could help in convincing them. <clears throat> Pope John Paul II, in order to draw the difference, the difference between the two, uh, was engaged in Jewish friendship since his childhood. It was part of his biography. Ratzinger, however, proves to be friendly out of rational commitment that was a consequence of his obligation originated in the Second Vatican Council. He and Cardinal Koch are today repeating uh, statements for the importance of Nostra Aetate, and it is my hope that their positive campaign will continue also after um, the Declaration's 50th anniversary. We have to admit that it was just this conservative leadership of ca the Catholic Church who was instrumental in paving the way to establish a norm of political correctness which says a good, a good Catholic should accept a Jew as a close relative, be it as a big brother or any other parental relationship. The fact that the rapprochement with Jews has not been elevated to a binding doctrine requires constant alertness 
and a proactive attitude within the Catholic and Jewish establishments who support this process. Without campaigning and being repetitive, we cannot be sure that this process will not be diverted or diluted in the future. To assume that the principles of Nostra Aetate are widely accepted in the present globalized Catholic world is a premature conclusion. It is known that the protagonist among the conciliar fathers and experts who negotiated the Jewish paragraph 4 in 1962-63 of the text of Nostra Aetate faced a fierce internal opposition from conservative Curia members and from dignitaries of Oriental Catholic churches. At that, <clears throat> at that time, the secretary of the committee of Cardinal Bea, the Dutch Cardinal Willebrands, uh, who was his right hand of Bea, wrote in his recently published uh, <clears throat> book, uh, posthumously, that he had to convince political echelons in the Arab world that Nostra Aetate is favorable also to Muslims and therefore being supported. Willebrands was instrumental to introduce the third paragraph of Nostra Aetate concerning the Muslim in order to pacify the Arabs to give in, to give in on the fourth paragraph about Jews. The final text was probably the best outcome possible under prevailing circumstances. The Oriental Middle East Synod, which took place in 2010, has shown us that in some regions there is still a long way to go until anti-Judaic stereotypes will be abandoned. We should not weaken our alertness. For proactive campaigning in favor of Nostra Aetate in the foreseeable future, we will need the cooperation of the responsible authorities in the Catholic Church. It does not really matter if they belong to the conservative or the liberal wing. It is helpful for that matter that the Milstein Center at JTS, the John Paul Center in Rome, and the Center of, for Interreligious Understanding with many others will continue this process. Now. I would like to, to illuminate why I don't speak about reconciliation, but only on about, um, about rapprochement. I'm not against reconciliation at all, and if it is understood as an anthropological necessity to promote coexistence among past enemies, I am, for instance, a protagonist of the reconciliation between Jews and Germans. But to use this term in an interreligious context amounts to risk misunderstanding because it is a theologically loaded term. It may cause Catholics to expect a diverse horizon where the process might ultimately lead to. For the Jewish dialogue partner, it is important to know that in Catholic understanding, reconciliation is part of the sacrament of confession, which is formally called sacrament of penance and reconciliation. Through this sacrament, the Catholic believer obtains the divine mercy for the sins he committed against God and neighbor and is reconciled um, with the community with the church, uh, of the church through this sacrament allows him to participate in the ceremony of the Eucharist, otherwise he's banned from it. This particular meaning might not, might not be very helpful for creating a common ground to a genuine process of reconciliation without preconditions. The insoluble catch is that the Jewish side cannot avoid demanding to resist of any Christian action which might lead to its conversion. Willebans wrote in his diary that in the wake of the negotiations of Nostra Aetate, he has, he has asked Rabbi Abraham Heschel his opinion uh, about a formulation aiming to convert Jews. Heschel answered him that it would amount to a cultural genocide. 
The Catholic side might not be able to abandon fully the idea of wanting to share the Christian truths with Jews. The limit of the con reconciliation is that in order to respect fully the legitimate Jewish demand, the Catholic side will have to negate their own belief. We had in the wake of the Good Friday controversy in April 2008, a case in which the Holy See had to quiet the controversy. In a letter addressed to the Secretary General of the Chief Rabbinate of Israel, and by the way, I have here to stress that the fact that the, upon the initiative of the John Paul II began a dialogue, religious dialogue, between the Chief Rabbinate of Israel and the relevant uh, committee in the Vatican, was the missing link for the religious level for the diplomatic relations uh, between Israel and the Vatican. Now, it was important enough, and the Vatican could not afford an open break uh, between the, them and uh, the rabbinate. So the Holy See had to phrase its expect expectation of converting the Jews in a non-operational, timeless, eschatological context in order to contain the uproar of the Jews. The letter was considered very important politically and was endorsed, if not formulated, by Pope Benedict and Cardinal Caspar. I do not know, however, why, in formulating the letter, the Holy See did not use the, the word or the phrase taken from the Nostra Aetate or appearing in Nostra Aetate that the church awaits the day known to God alone, and the direct quote, when all peoples will call on God with one voice and serve him shoulder to shoulder. And this is a, a quotation from the Bible, from the Tanakh. It is a quotation, and I think that many, many Jews would have difficulties to object to such a phrasing. But we have more difficulties in our uh, relations between Jews and Catholics. And it is the matter of forgiveness. In Judaism, a person cannot obtain forgiveness from God for wrongs the, per <clears throat> the person has done to other people. This also means that unless a victim forgave the perpetrator before he died, murder is unforgivable in Judaism. If a person causes harm, but then sincerely and honestly apologizes to be wronged, an individual and tries to rectify the wrong, the wronged individual is religiously required to grant forgiveness. This is in the Mishneh Torah of Maimonides, and this is also the Shulchan Aruch. Today, however, Jews, <clears throat> Jews forgot this kind of duty. In Christianity, forgiveness is practiced almost every week. With absolution of sins after the confession or penance and not penance, forgiveness plays a big role in the New Testament as it is associated with the divine grace. The discrepancy between the two religions as they are practicing forgiveness today seems to me a source of constant Christian disappointment. But why most Orthodox Jews did not follow Maimonides' norms and have difficulties in being forgiving today? And I think here that, and by this chapter I will conclude, I will have to speak about the role of being victimized in Catholic Jewish relations. Most Jews perceive their history during their diaspora as a traumatic battle of survival against constant Christian efforts to convert them gently, or in most cases, coercively. The Jewish history is in the bulk, non-scholar approach is a history of catastrophes. The process of separation of the early Christian community from the bonds of mainstream Judaism created a vast corpus of polemical literature in which Jews had also their share. 
The animosity extended into the European Middle Ages, during which Jews lived as a minority under the Christian domination was not the best conducive way for open relations. Most Orthodox Jews would still neither enter a church nor like to be confronted with a crucifix until today. Confronted, I mean, very sight of a crucifix. As a, I, as a counselor in Jerusalem, had to, uh, to deal a lot with spitting on crosses and on clergymen, which happened to cross uh, mainly Armenians through the Jewish quarter uh, and so on. This traumatic behavior <clears throat> continues today as a sort of a Pavlovian reflex. A serious painful wound inflicted in the past opens up time and again whenever the victim is confronted with the symbols of the perpetrator. This pattern of behavior may be considered offensive. It contributes to a new cycle of polemics and apologetic postures on the Christian side. But in addition to this, there is also an invisible and unspoken obstacle which obviously prevents many, many Jews to, pre, to be involved in Catholic-Jewish relationships. The trigger of any dialogue is a sense of a basic curiosity to get to know the other side better. Knowing and understanding better, the other implies also to be ready to forgive him. Tolstoy coined in his War and Peace already the famous phrase, to understand means also to forgive. It might be, in French it sounds better, to comprendre c'est tout pardonner. It might be very well that many Jews being still victimized through the memory of the Shoah would like to avoid any situation in which they will have to pardon someone, especially if he is identified rightly or wrongly <clears throat> as representing the perpetrator. To be victimized is not synonym with being personally a victim, a survivor. If being a victim is a factual statement, being victimized is a state of mind. The victimized Jew seems unable to extend absolution for neither distant nor recent misdeeds done to his brothers and sisters. But the relation seems to be even more complex than already described. I was told at the beginning of my tenure in the Vatican that not only Jews are afraid of Christians, this we know, but that also Christians are afraid of Jews. I try to understand what the reasons to experience fear of Jews are. I try to figure out what kind of reasons it may, may, may have. Theologically speaking, Christianity defines itself from being an offspring from Judaism. Judaism never ceased to attract Christians. Dialoguing with Jews is a necessity as an exercise of seeking one own Christian identity. This dependence causes also, at the same time, anxiety. After 45, Pius XII cultivated very much the notion of the church being the victim of Nazism and Bolshevism. Both are still today termed as godless systems hostile to Christianity. Hence, Jews and Catholics feel being victims of Nazi persecution at the same time. Many past and present misunderstandings between Catholics and Jews have their origin in the state of mind of being victimized. Jews are often not aware to the degree Catholics are sensitive to offenses and mistrust from the Jewish side. Recently, it became fashionable even among Catholics in order to strike a balance. Uh, some Catholic circles to lament on the fate of Catholic minority being a victim of the Jewish majority in Israel. I do not mention the Catholics who allegedly became victims under the occupation being Palestinians. This is kind of a balance uh, which is, of course, a cycle of 
this created polemics. To sum up, it is widely known that the one who feels victimized does not have much room for compassion towards the other. Unfortunately, this remains relevant to large segments of both Jews and Catholics alike. The last thing I wanted to is to weaken the hands of those who are fully dedicated to the process of rapprochement. We Jews cannot afford not to take the hand stretched out to us with the openness promulgated in Nostra Aetate. After almost 2,000 years of shared history, which cannot be defined otherwise than ill-fated, Jews and Christians deserve a better common future. Thank you.